focus on what matters. Welcome to the next installment of Axios Latino entitled Education's Curriculum for Success. I'm Russell Contreras, the race and justice reporter at Axios, and I'm coming at you from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And thank you to Bank of America for making this conversation possible during National Hispanic Heritage Month on how education systems are devoting increased resources to preparing students for equal opportunity and economic prosperity. And welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, Axios.com. Join the conversation today on Twitter with at Axios and use the hashtag Axios events. Over the next 30 minutes, we will discuss school's valuable role for the next generation of leaders and the importance of teaching inclusive, relevant skills that reflect the demands of the modern workforce. Our first guest is the representative from New Mexico's 3rd Congressional District, Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, joining us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Congresswoman Ledger Fernandez, thank you for joining us. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I'm really looking forward to discussing this incredibly important topic. And, and then we appreciate that. But before we get into the discussion of education, I want to bring up a woman who grew up in the district you now represent. Manuelita de Achoa Lucero Leisure. She was a four-year-old girl who learned to read Spanish so she could read the newspaper to her blind grandfather. She later became a pioneer in bilingual education in the state and the country. She was also your mother. How influential was she in developing your passion for education and getting you where you are now? Well, you almost made me cry talking about her. Uh, my mother and both my mother and father were incredibly influential. Um, they understood the miracle that happens, as my mother used to describe it, when a child learns to read. They also understood the importance of making sure there was bilingual education so that Hispanos, Latinos in not only uh, New Mexico, but across this country were able to maintain their language in addition to becoming proficient in English, because that was something that helped you, uh, helped your brain grow, right? And helped you be a more successful student, as well as, you know, that pride in your cultural identity. Um, I am on education and labor. I think because of my mother and father, I invoked them a lot on the campaign trail. I no longer have them with me, but I am sure they were up in heaven helping me get this spot in, that, mm -hmm. uh, in education and labor. The district you now represent has been key to education and civil rights in the country's history. George I. Sanchez wrote the 1940 book, Forgotten People, looking at the schools in Taos, Panasco, the areas, the show about the poverty and the discrimination Latino and Native students face. But today we have the Yazi Martinez lawsuit that is basically putting the questions, the same thing that George I. Sanchez asked nearly 70 years ago about getting Latinos and Native American students equal opportunity in education. What's going on? Why have we taken so long? And what can we finally do to address this inequality? Yazi Martinez, I think, was a seminal case in which we had a court actually say, our schools are failing our Latino, Native American, and other disadvantaged students because our constitution requires that we educate our children. And we were failing in that constitutional duty. I sit at the federal level, and what I want to make sure we do is assist states like New Mexico, but it's not just New Mexico. These issues, I think, affect every school district where you have a large percentage of Latinos or English language learners, um, where they need to have the resources to be able to provide what those students need. And I think there are three ways in which we can help at the federal level. One is we need to make sure that we are providing that early child uh, education. Uh, the state of New Mexico is now looking at doing that. We have, uh, we, we, we have a department, we have a way of saying we need to highlight early childhood education. And at the federal level, you know, that is a key element of our Build Back Better agenda. Uh, we also need to make sure that our schools have the infrastructure they need so that the schools are not falling down, that they have the technology they need. Uh, but we also need to make sure that there are culturally competent teachers. We know that children do better in school when they are taught 
by a Latino, a, a little, a, a little Latina child going to school by a Latina teacher, you know, and vice versa, whatever it happens to be. So, but right now we don't have that. And so we need to make sure that we are training uh, teachers that come from the community that reflect the children that they are teaching, because then that's where the aspiration starts. Uh, and finally, we need to also make sure that we invest in that higher education that our students need, partially because that's how we fill the pipeline of making sure that we have teachers who are coming from the communities where they will be teaching. Congressman, right now there is a teacher shortage nationally in places like Dulce, New Mexico, the home of the Hickory Apache, and Chama, New Mexico, where a lot of Latinos live in rural areas, have a hard time recruiting teachers. What could be done to recruit teachers in these isolated rural areas who are on the front lines of this educational uh, equity battle? I think that's an excellent question. I will say that I actually worked in Dulce doing things like building housing so that uh, people who go to work there will have a place to live, which is really important. So we always have to remember that these issues around education are connected to other issues about creating communities that can thrive. Um, but some of the things we are working on in Congress, as an example, is we want to put more funding into the Grow Your Own programs um, that is in the Build Back Better Bill, uh, where we will increase the funds available to make sure that we address teacher shortages in high need subjects as well as schools, because this is one of the ways in which you increase diversity so that, you know, people will be coming from Chama, getting those degrees and then going back and teaching because I know that in places like Chama and our beautiful uh, rural areas, people wanna go home. They do love that where they come from, but we need to make sure that they are able to get their college education without having burdensome debt. So we need to double the Pell Grant. Uh, we need to make sure that they that we provide more funding to minority serving institutions because those are the institutions that are going to be serving the teachers who come from those communities whether it be Dulce or Chama or in any other community that has you know Latino a need for Latino teachers and then we need to pay teachers more we need to pay teachers what they deserve and that is something that we need to work on across the, you know, across the spectrum. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, creating that infrastructure in those communities so there's good broadband, uh, so they can stay connected to the world, so that they can assign subjects uh, and, and projects that require that the students, you know, plug into the internet and gather information. And, you know, that's the broadband work that we need to do. So many of the things we're working on in Congress right now in the Build Back Better Bill actually would help that from housing to the direct subsidies for education and for things like Grow Your Own Program. In the final two minutes we have left, uh, I wanted to bring up the time when you were running for office, you and I spoke and you said, one of the things that gets you to pause when you were touring the district that you were gonna represent, was the poverty you encountered. Some places still don't have running water. Schools don't have broadcast, uh, access to broadband. Now that you're in Congress and you're working to resolve some of these issues, what is keeping you up at night when you think about the work ahead of you? They're the same issues that gave me pause then. We must make a concerted effort to address inequality in our country. And, uh, and ranging from what you just described to make sure that broadband is something that is universal, not simply available to those living in cities or those communities that have the ability to pay for it, right? So that is something that we are working to do uh, to make sure that we make that universal. Um, that we look at the child tax credit. The child tax credit is something that's going to help lift children out of poverty. In New Mexico, we lifted 50% of the children living in poverty came out because of the child tax credit. I wanna make sure that we make that, uh, that it doesn't expire in December. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do when we're pushing the Build Back Better uh, bills that we will pass. 
Those are the things that keep me up at night, making sure that we have a concerted, dedicated effort to addressing all of those interconnected issues that keep people down. I want our children to thrive, thrive, right? Not survive, thrive. And so I think that the agenda we are pursuing right now, that's where we're headed, is to give our kids the opportunity to reach their potential and to not have poverty hold them back. And I'm still committed to that. And actually, it energizes me. It doesn't keep me up at night. It energizes me to keep up this work. Freshman Congresswoman Ledger Fernandez, thank you for joining us. You did well on your Axios debut. (laughs) Thank you. Bye-bye. And next, we have a View from the Top segment with my colleague, Chief People Officer at Axios, Dominique Taylor. Now joining us is President of Business Banking at Bank of America, Raul Anaya. Welcome, Raul. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And also joining us is Director of the Smithsonian Latino Center and Interim Director of the National Museum of the American Latino, Eduardo Diaz. Welcome, Eduardo. Thank you very much for uh, for having me, Dominique. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Me too. Always a great pleasure (laughs) to be with Raul. Uh, Eduardo, earlier this year, the Smithsonian launched a new initiative called Our Shared Future, Reckoning with Our Racial Past. Can you tell us about that program and what the Smithsonian is trying to achieve? Sure. I think, uh, you know, with the murder of uh, George Floyd um, was cathartic. Uh, It brought to bear uh, a lot of underlying historical aspects of the way race and racism has uh, shaped this country's history and and culture. And I think it was a pivotal moment when the Smithsonian needed to do something and step forward to address it in ways that that only the Smithsonian in some ways can do in confronting the historical roots of, um, and the contemporary impacts actually, of race and racism in this country. And so we put together this project uh, called Our Shared Futures, Reckoning with Our Racial Past. And we are very grateful, of course, that Bank of America stepped forward and provided amazing funding uh, to to support it. And, you know, we'll be, you know, doing research, of course, a lot of scholarship that needs to be done, looking for partnerships, in organizing ways for people to engage, whether it's a a town hall or small conversations, make adequate use of social media, of course, and the media in general to really begin to start a conversation among people who perhaps really haven't thought much about how race and racism uh, has shaped the history of this country and also impacted national culture. So I think you know, it's, it's a huge undertaking. Um, the way in which the Smithsonian has organized it is uh, in, in three basic categories. I can go into those a little bit later on. But looking at the issues of wellness and wealth and, and um, you know, place and, of course, politics and, and so forth. And then, you know, it's not just about the United States, right, because the United States is part of a global community. And of course, race and racism also impacts uh, global societies and specific countries in general with which uh, the the United States interacts on a a regular basis on many levels, whether it's diplomatic, whether it's economic, uh, cultural exchanges and so forth. So I think it's important to see this, yes, from a national perspective, of course, but also within the context of of a more globalized picture. Very important work. Uh, and Eduardo, conversations on race and racism take different paths depending on the group of people participating. Can you discuss how that initiative at the Smithsonian addresses the impacts of racism on Latino communities? Sure. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's a book called Inventing um, Latinos that I just finished reading by uh, Laura Gomez, who's a law professor at UCLA, also teaches sociology, in which she really addresses this issue of are Latinos an ethnic group or are we a race, right? And it, it's a complicated uh, uh, question. Uh, the answer is, is never really clear. 
Are there different perspectives on this? I happen to agree with uh, Professor Gomez that, in fact, uh, Latinos have been racialized uh, over the many years, understanding that, um, you know, Raul and I are from a part of the country where we often say, you know what, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And when the border did cross us at the end of the Mexican-American War of 1848, uh, Latinos, and, and particularly Mexicans, became uh, racialized. Some of the things that you see, I'm smiling because they're so outrageous. Some of the Senate debates on whether or not to allow, for example, New Mexico to be a state to let uh, you know the Mexican mongrels into the to the union, are, it's, it's pretty vicious language, right? And, and and if that's not racialized language, I don't know what is. And so you have this historical record of Latinos being racialized uh, over many years, school desegregation cases. Uh, you see it in the historical record, right? So, you know, um, it's something that um, Latinos continue to to deal with. Some people see it as an, as an ethnic group, um, and some people see us as a race, right? Uh, and and in fact, we are a race. I mean, I. It's interesting, I just did my DNA research, right? So Ancestry.com reveals that I'm 50% Mexican indigenous, right? Which is the majority of what I am in terms of bloodline, right? So in fact, I am an indigenous person, right? I don't necessarily go around making a big deal out of it. It's just who I am. You know, many of us of Mexican descent are, are mixed race, mestizos, if you will. And this is part of who we are, but you know, many of us don't go around, you know, claiming tribal, affiliations or what have you, it just happens to be who we are from a racial perspective. 25% of Latinos identify as African descendant. That's a lot of people. 25% of 60 million is quite a number of people. And so these are people who trace their ancestries back to the African continent. So when you have, and then you have all the, the mixes that occurred, haven't been occurring since uh, European contact in the Americas, and you have this melange, this this miscegenation that is vast, diverse, and yes, um, racial and racialized. So I think Latino, the Latino experience in this country fits very well within what we are talking about with the Our Shared Future Initiative. Absolutely. And, and Raul, Bank of America is a founding partner of the initiative as part of your work to advance racial equality and economic opportunity. Can you share an update on the bank's commitment and how that work is impacting Latino communities? Absolutely, Dominique. So, you know, Bank of America, we have always been strong supporters around diversity inclusion. Um, we're very proud of, of, of the commitment that we've made recently in 2020. We came out with a $1.25 billion commitment to help address uh, the racial inequality and economic mobility issues among communities of color. And, and, and obviously, Hispanic Latino is a very important part of uh, our client base and our employee base. And it's just a way for us to, to represent our commitment to, to that sector, which is a very important part of our growth strategy. Um, our $1.25 billion our commitment is really tailored around small business, housing, health care, and uh, jobs. And uh, you know we're making great progress in that. We, uh, we continue to focus on ways to advance the dialogue around racial equality and economic mobility around the Hispanic Latino community and other communities of color as well. That's fantastic. Uh, in addition to that work, Bank of America is also a corporate founder of the new Molina Family Latino Gallery at the Smithsonian, and you're on the board for the new Museum of the American Latino. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you personally that the company has made those commitments? Look, I, you know, as, as a son of immigrant parents, I'm very, very excited to be part of that. That, that's this journey that we are taking together as a community um, with the Smithsonian's uh, Museum of the American Latino and being able to share my story, my own experiences and that those of my colleagues at Bank of America, certainly um, I feel very humbled, very honored to be part of this journey that quite frankly is just starting and super excited to, uh, to continue to this path over the next several years. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Raul, and thank you, Eduardo, for joining me today for such a worthy conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dominic. Appreciate you having us. Thanks, Dominic. And thank you to Bank of America for sponsoring these important conversations. 
And now back to my colleague, Russell Contreras. Thanks, Dominique. Our final guest is the Chancellor of the California State University System, Dr. Joseph I. Castro, joining us from Long Beach, California. Chancellor Castro, thank you for joining us from the LBC. How are you doing today? I'm well. It's great to see you, Russ. Thank you for inviting me. Before we get started on what we're going to discuss today, I wanted to us to go back to when you grew up in California's rural central Joaquin Valley. You came from a family of Mexican-American farm workers, and statistics show that this may have been your destiny too, but you attended a, a fair, a local fair, where you caught the attention of someone who changed your life. What happened? Yeah, thank you. I, I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley of California. My great-grandfather came here to this country to help build the railroad uh, through the San Joaquin Valley, and they lived in tents along the railroad and then finally settled in my hometown of Hanford. And I was raised by my grandfather, who was just a two and a half when he came to this country, and, um, and his wife, my grandmother, and then my mother, um, and I'll tell you, the story of, of going to UC Berkeley was really uh, an incredible experience for me. I met a counselor at my high school who just happened to be there on behalf of the, one of the federal TRIO programs. He invited me to a program in downtown Fresno uh, where the UC Berkeley counselors were talking about opportunities for students like me from the San Joaquin Valley to go there. And what I didn't understand is after I handed my application to the counselor, uh, she reviewed it. And this was in the days when we had paper applications. She admitted me right on the spot with my mother there by my side. I couldn't believe that that happened. And for me, that's one of the amazing gifts that I've received that I try to pay back, uh, uh, pay it forward every day as a chancellor of the CSU. Speaking of play it forward, as a college administrator, you joined the student service side of the system, where you argued investment in education must also include meals, housing, health care for poor students, especially young Latino and Black students. Um, this goes in conflict with some others who say, no, we should invest money in teachers and research. But you believe that student services play a central role in equity. Why is that case? Yeah, I believe that we need to invest in our students. Uh, they are the next generation of leaders. And in order for us to support them, we, of course, need to have uh, extraordinary faculty members in the classroom. Uh, but we also need staff members uh, to support their experience all along the way. And we need to make sure that they have food and housing, uh, access to technology, all the tools necessary to be successful. And the CSU is the nation's largest and most diverse university. Uh, I believe that we need to uh, lead the way in terms of eliminating inequities so that students from all backgrounds can be successful. Now, you mentioned that this is the largest system in the country. And a lot of people do not know that, that California State right. University system is the largest. But you plan on addressing equity through partnerships with Apple and new STEM centers to recruit Latino students. What is that program about? Yeah, we are the largest uh, public university in the country, nearly 500,000 students across 23 campuses, uh, ranging 800 miles in distance from Humboldt in the north to San Diego State in the south. And, uh, and we are working uh, very aggressively to eliminate inequities, and that's one of the reasons why we've partnered with Apple uh, to make sure that our new students, um, especially at eight campuses this fall through our, U our C success program, that they actually have access to a quality Apple iPad that they can use to do their schoolwork. And then we're also partnering with Apple around a new uh, Hispanic serving equity innovation hub that will be housed at CSU Northridge and will serve the entire country. It will be a place where Hispanic serving institutions uh, like 21 of our Cal State campuses, 
as well as hundreds across the country uh, will be able to work together to serve students from Latino and other backgrounds and help prepare them for STEM fields. And we believe that through the sharing of uh, innovative ideas and with resources aligned from the state of California and Apple, that we're going to be very successful in uh, supporting a whole new generation of Latino and other underrepresented students who go into STEM uh, professions. Now, the CSU system has been a magnet for immigrant students, especially dreamers, those undocumented students who grew up in the United States. You've been an advocate and you've talked to President Biden about this to get undocumented students access to Pell Grants. Why is this important? Yes, we serve about 10,000 undocumented students throughout the Cal State. And um, these are extraordinarily talented students who've done everything uh, that they can within their power to be successful academically. And when I was president at Fresno State, many of them were our dean's medalists and president's medalists. So I know they are filled with talent. And uh, I want to make sure that we support them along with our other students. And it's very important that the federal government provide Pell Grants to DACA students so that they have the financial support to be successful. I had a chance to discuss this with Secretary Cardona and with other members of the administration. And that's one of our highest priorities for the CSU system in Washington, D.C., is to double the Pell Grant the double the maximum Pell Grant and provide Pell Grants to our DACA students. Many non-traditional students, um, to those who come out of high school who may have left high school early, start at a community college level. And they may take a few years before they get their basics or two year associate's degree. The, the CSU system has made it seamlessly to, to make sure that community college students can transfer to a CSU school, why is that important? And what should that be an example for, for other systems, especially for those non-traditional students? Over half of the almost 500,000 students in the CSU come through the community colleges. And I believe that that's a very important pathway for us to expand in the coming years. We just supported a, a bill that Governor Newsom signed just last week at the CSU Northridge campus, which will uh, open up pathways, make it much easier for students from all backgrounds, especially our underrepresented first generation students to navigate the transfer pathway. And I believe that that's gonna elevate California because we'll have more leaders from diverse backgrounds entering uh, different professions, and it will make a huge positive difference for California and the country. In our final 90 seconds we have left, what is the system doing to increase the diversity of its faculty? That's something that a lot of universities systems are struggling with, getting more professors that reflect the students they serve. What's the system doing? We know that uh, having diverse faculty in our classrooms will enable us to achieve our big and bold graduation rate goals and to eliminate graduation gaps between underrepresented students and Pell Grant students and other students. And I believe that we can be even more aggressive and each of the 23 presidents shares this view. Uh, we can be more aggressive in recruiting and supporting our, our faculty from diverse backgrounds, and that will make an enormous difference in the success of our students. Have you adjusted yet to Long Beach from Fresno? It's a big cultural difference. <laughs> it is a big difference. I'm enjoying it. It's a, it's a great professional challenge, and it's a beautiful city. Uh, but as you know, there's no place like home, so I get to return back there and see family from time to time. Chancellor Castro, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Russ. Thank you all for joining this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. And thank you to our sponsor, Bank of America, for making this event possible. 
For more information or to sign up for our Axios Latino newsletter, visit axios.com slash newsletters or go to our Axios app. Thank you all for joining us during this National Hispanic Heritage Month, and we'll see you next time on axios.com.